Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny to all of my returning subscribers. Hey, how you doing? And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome, kick your feet up, subscribe to this family friendly channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss any posts. Also follow me on Instagram at the same profile name so you don't miss the sneak peeks of what's coming up next. In this video, it's Atlanta season three, episode four entitled The Big Payback. I give a full episode recap with photos offset to the side, and then I give my review at the end. No need to dig around and keep all of the minute marks in the comments. It's all coming up next. A white man listens to a podcast concerning human situations that equate to wildlife. Certain behaviors are all about communication and who can understand. He enters his vehicle after getting his morning coffee and realizes that he got away with taking a pack of cookies. A blue car secretly follows. The man picks up his daughter and their small talk with the wife. He continues to listen to a podcast about how a black man sued Josh Beckford, an early investor of Tesla. His relatives were enslaved by the Beckford family. The human capital and profit can be directly linked to the company. The black man won the lawsuit. The daughter notes to her dad that mom sprayed perfume before he came over. Maybe it's because she wants him back and to come home. She even asks him if he can come by and spend the night soon. He can only promise that he will try to speak with her mom. He gets an un known call that he ignores before leaving the school. When he arrives to his destination, the blue car that followed earlier is still on the lookout. A co-worker is appalled at the black man who won the Tesla lawsuit. It seems unfair, but our main character of Focus still doesn't see the big deal. Josh Beckford will still be rich. There's an emergency meeting with the staff called to everyone, and they're clueless as to why. It's confirmed the CEO announced the company will unfortunately administer some layoffs. A woman shouts, this is ridiculous, and with instant stress, she massages her neck. Our main character thinks in silence about his family until a co-worker says she's nervous. She thinks their company could be experiencing the same lawsuit as Tesla. She's adamant about doing research on her own family to make sure she's in the clear. Everyone else needs to, and people are doing it at work, on the internet. She scoffs at black co-workers across the room, saying, look at them, it must be nice. Not a care in the world. There's continued calls from an unknown caller, but he ignores them again. After work, a woman hysterically cries loudly in front of her car. He listens to the radio and black show hosts brag about their legal winnings and they can't wait to do more research. They're sure that Nike owes them money as well. As he listens, black people around him are living well. There's even several foreign cars being filled up at the gas station. His daughter is worried. Are we slave owners? Mr. Pedro does work in our backyard. He laughs off the idea. We're Australia-Hungarian. They were enslaved during Bensinia Empire. Should I fly to Hungary and demand money now? No, that would be ridiculous, right? Later at dinner, there's another unknown call, but it's ignored. The blue car that's followed him all day parks and then knocks at the door. It's a request for Marshall Johnson. You've been served. A black woman pulls out her phone to record and announces herself. My name is Shaniqua Johnson of the St. Louis Johnson. Your family owned my great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother for 12 years. You owe me some money. Marshall thinks that there's been a big mistake and he wants to talk outside, but Shaniqua walks in live streaming his home. After she leaves, he tells his daughter, don't tell your mother about this, okay? Marshall heads out the next morning, not before making sure they are safe. When he arrives to work, he learns that all the black people didn't come to work. His coworker is happy. Her results came in. She's 69% Jewish. He brings up his Austria-Hungarian ancestors that they were enslaved as well, but she tells him, come on, Marshall. That was like millions of years ago. While in the restroom, a guy wears a shirt reading, I owned slaves. He learns the black family that sued him just wanted him to acknowledge it. He has to wear that shirt twice a week and one of the days has to be Sunday. She thinks that he got off easy. Shaniqua is now in the parking lot with a bullhorn announcing Marshall's business. He owes her money. He's clearly making more than she is and she wants her money. While in the break room, two black men talk about the new things that they need to buy. Maybe they can finally get a car and a phone because they need it. Marshall pulls one of the gentlemen to the side to ask him what should he do. He's not rich and the woman outside is ruining his life. 
he suggests Marshall should just admit that his great-great-grandfather was wrong and just give as much money as he can. Pictorially, the scene cuts off very quickly as Marshall ignores that notion and then asks the same question to his white co-workers. They say, fight this case. Others learn their lineage and they're confused. What's 100% Nordic? Natalie texts Marshall saying she picked up Katie from school and they need to talk now. When he arrives, she wants to know if it's true. She's proud now to claim that she's Peruvian and would never do such a thing, but he doesn't understand. She claimed to be white before. She doesn't want him in her house and doesn't even want to consider talking any further. She tells him her finances can't take a hit and they need to make the divorce final. When he arrives home, a group of black people are having a cookout in front of his home listening to Keith Sweat. It's Shaquita and her family. When Marshall tries to drive off quickly, it's a comedic scene of one of her family members running behind the car, but he can't shake it. He's keeping up with the speed of the car. Later that night, Marshall has to check into a hotel. He can't even find comfort in watching TV. There are lawyer commercials that claim to help people that are owed restitutions, even the taxes. It's too much and Marshall breaks down into tears trying to enjoy a complimentary cookie. Marshall then goes down to the lobby. There are even hotel employees asking if Marshall needs a drink. We even see a familiar character from episode one. He's looking for a new place and he introduces himself as Ernest. Marshall vents to Ernest. Why is this even happening to me? I didn't even do anything. My life was great just the other day with my wife and daughter. Ernest tells a story about how his grandfather would always brag about his father, how he built everything with his own hands from the ground up, that he pulled up his own bootstraps. Turned out it was all a lie. He had a lot of help and a lot of children. Maybe everything that's happening is right. We were treating slavery as if it were a mystery buried in the past. That history has a monetary value. Confession is not absolution. To them, slavery is not the past or a mystery. It's not a historian curiosity. It's a ghost that haunts them in ways we can't understand. So now your wife will raise your child without a father and build wealth on her own. She's building wealth all over again from the ground up. The same situation we placed them in. We're gonna be okay. The curse is lifted from your daughter. The curse has been lifted from us, and now we're free. Ernest goes outside to enjoy his drink, and Marshall watches happy videos of Shaquita and her family on Instagram. Then there's a loud gunshot. It appears that Ernest has taken his own life at the hotel pool. The black co-worker says, there's more where that came from. It's a quiet ride on the bus, and a young man heads to work. During a morning meeting for a waiter staff, Marshall has joined the team. The manager announces that anyone that has to pay restitution taxes to stay after the meeting. Marshall's tax percentage goes to Shaniqua Jackson and it's 15%. Marshall tries to find some silver lining in saying, well, at least the tips aren't garnished. Minnie Ripperton plays in the background as the staff preps fine dining. As the camera pans out to the final scene, it's a room filled with minority customers. And that is the end of the episode. And now it is time for your favorite part of the video. That's right, my review. So obviously, again, the writing is phenomenal. And this is an exaggeration when we talk about restitution and reparations. So for those of you that don't know, let's discuss the difference between restitution and reparation. Restitution is the restoring to the rightful owner, right? What has been lost or taken. Reparations is the resorting to good condition, right? Giving back something in good condition, something that was damaged, right? So we have to understand that. An example of a reparation is money paid for for an item broken in the store. Anything paid or done to make up for something else. Compensation. Compensation by a nation defeated in a war for economic losses suffered by a victor or for the crimes committed. 
uh, against individuals payable in money, labor, goods, etc. So we have this this understanding of the difference between the two. You often hear the arguments when it comes to a lot of political stances and conversations about reparations. People say we need reparations. You know, your people of color saying we need reparations, and you know, understanding that in this uh, systematic and systemic way of America, the restitution we're talking about a legal process of compensation. That's why you see the lawyer commercials. You see people getting uh, legal documents of their ancestry, who they are. This this restitution of ancient rights uh, to the crown, per se. Once again, beautifully written in an episode that's not an hour, but we say 30 minutes, but that's even including commercials. So we're saying at least 26 minutes of saying a lot, a lot pictorially that we're seeing beautifully written written so let's talk about white privilege okay white privilege you know I I, you know I have white friends who years ago I explained this to them they said oh now I get it I didn't know what that what that meant and a lot of my white friends would say you know white privilege I'm not privileged I don't know why they keep saying that I'm, I'm not privileged I'm not rich this is a sociology term that helps when you're talking about matters of America white privilege or a white skin privilege your skin as Paul Mooney would say the complexion for the protection so basically this white privilege terminology is the white privilege or white skin privilege is the societal privilege that benefits white people over non-white people in some societies more specifically otherwise under the same social political and economic circumstances so with all of that there's a privilege based upon your skin right the wife in this episode all of the sudden recollects her Peruvian ancestry, right? And then claims it proudly. Clearly she's used her white skin or appearance as a protection from society. Even Marshall, the character said, well, you've been white this entire time. You were white yesterday. You know, it's like, what? And we're also talking about the scene of the coworker who was nervous, right? She was super nervous and afraid before because you know she's claiming this this white right white skin protection and finding out that she's jewish and that jewish and now she's saying well you know i i I can let it out now it's it's you know i have the the percentage i know what it is now and we were slave too jews were slave too it's this it's this knowing she had her protection with her skin and now until her results results are coming back now she's nervous right now she's a she's afraid but now all of a sudden there's this pride in learning or if she knew who she was because she said oh it's out now so it's just like was she hiding her true identity and who she was so it, it it just it's just so much to dissect let's talk about the laws preventing black wealth so if any of you have had any financial classes any social sociology classes that helps to understand this black to white wealth gap it's generational which makes it difficult to close it's this gap that's difficult to close because this is something that's happened for so many years wealth is crucial for households uh, when it comes to economic security, their economic opportunities, their protection against economic crisis, and COVID-19, you guys, if anything, just plastered those statistics in everybody's face. The large and consistent and persistent black-white wealth gap follows from centuries of policies, legal policies that have systemically disadvantaged Black Americans' ability to build, maintain, and pass on wealth. Systemic inequalities allows the gaps to continue. It's actually widened over the past three decades, which, which means it's getting worse. Let's look at the stats. You know, you hear people say, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, which really just means nothing's changed. You know, it's just like a little smart way to, you know, make it sound more than what it is. But the average, let's just look at just 2019, America and the dynamic, right? So the average household wealth by race and selected demographic, the characteristics, this is based on 2019, you guys. So this is recent. Let's just compare black, white when it comes to education we're talking about the overall wealth coming in same college degree we see that million dollar difference almost two million dollar gap between a black person that has the same college education we're talking about lifetime lifetime earnings with the black of two hundred and seventy thousand, 
as compared to almost 2 million. We talk about family status, married close to, you know, a million four as compared to a married black family, 260,000. As we, you know, talk about age, you know, as you can see, the numbers are starting to increase because duh, the older you get, the more money you accumulate. We're talking about 75 or older with the black side, 177,000 as compared to the 1.1, right? Income. We're talking about income overall. Now, now let's let's get this straight. This is the Federal Reserve.gov stats. This is consumer finances. This is census information. This is Arthur's calculations based on the Board of Governors of Federal Reserve System. Okay. The table, the table one, when we talk about the wealth and age factor and household. It's clearly a dynamic of generational pay gaps, companies still not paying uh, according to skill set. Um, the U.S. black-white wealth gap widened, as we, as I discussed earlier. When we talk about 1989 to 2020, there's this major gap of white households compared to black households. And we're talking about the same education. We're talking about the same thing. And it's just... Comparing even the Great Recession to the start of the pandemic, there's still this huge gap. African Americans see fewer wealth gains from a booming stock market, as typically it happens, starting from later stages of the recession. So they just there are several things that can be discussed when it comes to these wealth gaps. We can even discuss the real estate market. Let's just talk about one example in real estate market. We've got to talk about this so-called forgotten history of the U.S. government and how it was purposely done to segregate America when it comes to this American dream. Federal housing policies created after the Depression, after World War II, ensured that African Americans and other people of color were left out of this new suburban community dream and pushed instead into urban houses, the projects, right? The, 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 the ghettos. If we talk about 1933, when we talked about this housing shortage that was happening, the federal government became a program specifically designed to increase and segregate American housing stock. Let's just talk about that. It was designed primarily to design and provide housing to white, middle class, lower class families. African Americans were not a part of this process. If you talk about giving homes literally super cheap to people who are not of color and even a lot of Asians profited from that. Cause you gotta think with housing, we housing, you have equity. And that is something that you can pass down from generation to generation. So it was this big gap, even starting there of trying to redevelop and after the great depression and after World War II, just really do your research about redlining, the redlining and now here it is 20, 2022. And even a lot of people who are trying to sell their homes, they have friends who are white that pose for them to even give some way up on actually having a good you know number or good amount to sell their homes in this is this is this is facts this has been investigated that the house the values the house of the value is entered lower when it's a black homeowner but when it's a white homeowner the estimates are higher it's still happening to this day it's very very sad um the red lining at the same time the fh FHA was subsidized builders who were mass producing entire subdivisions for white people with the requirement of none of the homes to be sold to African Americans. This has been going on. So if you think about just that one example from starting from 1933, clearly it's just, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and there's a good book, uh, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. It's very, very, we, we got to talk about it. You know, when when there's a lot of topics about, it's you're making it about race, not about race. It is about race. And America is always about race. There are deep-rooted things. We talk about in the judicial system. We're talking about with jobs, having the same career, the same skill set, the same education, and yet being underpaid. And they're not even thinking about also if you're a woman, it's just things piled up and piled up and piled up. African-American families that were prohibited from buying homes in, subur in sub suburbs in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s by the Federal Housing Administration gained none of the equity that they appreciated that the whites did, that they gained. This is facts. 
This is wealth. This is passed down. Okay. We even talk about escheat laws and escheat things that say, for instance, you're black and your grandmother has a home, right? And she passes it down to you with education of knowing who owns the home, who owns the land, who owns the air above the house. You know, all of those things are being investigated and understanding what's owed to people, descendants, because old money is maintained. There's this, there's this pool and this climb up for a lot of black people trying to understand how can we have a piece of the American dream? And here it is, we're still in this day and age to where it's just not fulfilled. At the same time, Right. The industry was leaving. It was industries were leaving cities and African-Americans were becoming poor in those areas. The projects became projects for poor people, not for working class people. They became subsidized. So they hadn't been subsidized before. So now it became this vertical slum and not allowing this growth, being stuck, right, stuck in the middle, school hard knocks, the, the hard life. Uh, white only subsidized areas of families were living in white housing projects as well as whites who were living elsewhere in central you know to move out of the central cities into these white only suburbs so think you're a poor white American and then all of a sudden you're granted a home because you're white even though you've come from the slums your family have come from the slums it was clearly this idea to start America over starting fresh after Great Depression, after World War II, after all of those things. And they just continue generation to generation to generation. And that's just real estate. We're not even talking about work life. We're not even talking about health care, business ownership, land, clothing, fashion, food, science, education, Every anything you can think of when you talk about development and living life, there is a barrier and there is a life tax when you are a person of color. What a beautifully written episode. I thought it was just this flip of understanding, getting this visual of what what's possible, right? And and what would happen. And this flip of understanding and putting on the other person's shoes. When the character Ernest said, well, you know, your wife has to start over, build her own wealth because the main source of income was coming from you. It's the same thing when we talk about before the pre-crack epidemic. Strong families from the 50s, 60s, and 70s divided and just, just completely just devoured by the crack situation in the 80s. When that happens, you have a lot of black men going to jail. You have, at the same time, white people using cocaine and not being punished the same way as black people. And sort of this pass on what drug we're going to let slide compared to the other. Every Anything you can dissect in this country when it comes to living there is the notion, there is this talk, there is the seriousness of race. Beautifully written. I know I keep saying that, but it was just absolutely amazing because we got to see how this man was fine, right? He was living his life, picking up his daughter, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, I might get back with my wife. She's spraying on, my daughter says she's spraying perfume before I come into the door. Everything's just fine. Nobody's suspecting him of stealing from a store. He got away with cookies. He didn't even go back and say, oops, you know, I didn't, I meant, I grabbed this. I'm sorry. He's eating it because he's used to getting away with it. It's this joy of the privilege, not being, not having to worry about it. Let's talk about this lineage this episode was trying to show and express how whether you did it or not, whether you personally enslaved people and you had slaves, you are benefiting from, right? You are benefiting from that. The great, 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 right? Was able to pass that down to you. That is the point of the episode, seeing that you didn't earn that thumbs up. You didn't earn that several steps ahead, right? You didn't earn that. It was given to you. It was given to you, not from, right, a family who earned it on their, on their own, as Ernest said, you know, they, he, he went on and on. 
And, you know, my grandfather went on and on talking about how he did all this, built everything from the ground up with his own hands. That was a lie. He had so much help, meaning that clearly there were slaves involved. And he had several children, which lets you know that that was that privilege of allowing to have a big family, wealth, you know, uh, because we hear that a lot. When that was written in the episode, I thought that was genius because you hear that a lot. Oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You know, you're free. You got equal rights. Like, what the heck? Not noticing that it's this gap that exists and because of white privilege you can't see it let me know what you think uh in the meantime in between time remember to write your comments below let me know what you thought about this if you're loving the season so far i know that i am atlanta has these moments of taking breaks from the main characters of the show and they talk about real issues that we deal with every day and how there's a domino effect and we see that then reflect in the characters so i think it's genius they ping pong back and some people get confused by that where are the characters what does this mean what's going on that's the point it correlates how it affects the characters and we see that in the characters so just just marvelous marvelous I, I hope it just rains emmys on the writers and the executive producers and the directors for this because it's at, shout out to donna glover absolutely amazing in the meantime in between time make sure that you binge watch other shows on the channel check out those playlists there's so much more and stay tuned for inventing anna it's coming next week i'll have the recaps and the reviews of that in the meantime in between time remember to take care of yourself and each other. Bye!